Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the second Sunday of the blessed month of Misra. However, tomorrow, our church celebrates the Feast of Holy Transfiguration. And this event of the Transfiguration, we know is recorded in three of the four Gospels. The Gospel of St. Matthew, the Gospel of St. Mark, and the Gospel of St. Luke. This weekend, we celebrate a major feast in the life of Christ. Saints Peter and James and John, three of the closest disciples with Christ, lived and traveled with Christ for three years. They witnessed unbelievable miracles, incredible healings, amazing teachings, crowds of people turning to God, And they were starting to believe that this rabbi, this Jesus of Nazareth, was maybe more than a teacher, maybe even more than a prophet. And just to give you some context before the feast, uh, the the transfiguration, shortly before they witnessed the miracle of Christ's transfiguration, Christ asked them a very important question. Who do people say that I am? And they told him, some say a prophet, some say St. John the Baptist, come alive. And when Christ asked his disciples themselves, who do you say that I am? St. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, responded by saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the disciples were beginning to believe. They were beginning to believe that Christ was more than a prophet, that he was more than a great teacher that he was more than just a miracle worker and a holy man. He was more. They were beginning to believe that he may actually be the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God himself. But they didn't understand. They didn't get it. Christ still confused them. Right after St. Peter acknowledged that Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus started to talk to them about how he was going to suffer and die in Jerusalem. They couldn't understand how the Son of God could talk about suffering and dying. And then Jesus even told them that if they wanted to follow him and to be his true disciples, that they themselves would have to learn how to deny themselves, take up their own crosses, and only then could they follow Christ. So this life of self-sacrifice and denial and death of one's own will is confusing to the followers. And this is all the precursor, this is all the context leading up to the transfiguration. Our Lord takes up Saints Peter and John and James and they hike up Mount Tabor and they spend the night in prayer. And in the middle of the night, our Lord becomes transfigured. As he is praying, he becomes as bright as the sun, light shining forth from his face and his entire body. He's not reflecting the sun, but he radiates the uncreated light of God. And as this light is shining from him, the great Old Testament prophets, Moses and Elijah, appear with him. Simultaneously, a bright cloud overshadows our Lord, and the disciples hear a voice proclaim, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What happened? What's going on? What did the disciples just witness? St. Gregory, he says, This light, then, is the light of the Godhead, and it is uncreated. According to the theologians, when Christ was transfigured, he neither received anything different, nor was changed into anything different, but was revealed to his disciples as he was, opening their eyes and giving sight to the blind. Take note that the eyes of the natural vision are blind to that light. It is invisible, and those who behold it do not simply Uh, do not do so simply with their bodily eyes, but with eyes transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. These followers of Christ, who were wrestling with who Jesus truly was, just witnessed an event that confirmed 
beyond any words that Christ truly is not only the Messiah, the Christ, but is God himself, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created, of one instance of the Father by whom all things are made radiating the uncreated light of the Almighty God. In other words, the uncreated divine light that shone forth from Christ reveals his authentic nature as one with God himself. Well, you can only imagine how overwhelmed the disciples felt. They got a glimpse of something that no human can see. They experienced the unexplainable. What do you do when you experience something like this? Well, St. Peter, in his initial amazement after his shock, he asks Christ if he should make some tents for Christ to stay together with Moses and Elijah. In other words, he doesn't want to leave this experience. And moments later, after the light disappears and Jesus returns to his normal appearance, he tells his followers, it's time to leave the mountaintop. It's time to leave. It's time to return back to the villages of Israel. From the mountaintop, they have to return to the normal, mundane, challenging life cycle. And this is a pause for reflection for all of us. As long as we are here on earth, we will have moments of the mountaintop experience. Some of us have experienced this just recently on mission trips abroad. This mountaintop experience. However, we will not stay in the high of Christ's divine light all the time. It's not good for us. God blesses us from time to time so that we then go share his blessings with others. He gives us moments of renewal and enlightenment to empower us to go back and to be his witnesses on earth in the midst of all the struggles that are in front of us. We experience the light and then we are called to go to the dark places and shine forth that light. This is the call of the followers of Christ. Saints Peter and James and John received an incredible blessing, but not to keep it for themselves. No, God blesses so that we can share his blessings with others. This is the center of what it means to be a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ, a Christian. Christ gives us clear examples of this in the, in the Gospels, which brings me to the Gospel of today. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 39, our Lord gives us this example with his own actions. Today we remember that he called Levi, St. Matthew, a tax collector to be his disciple. A tax collector. Just as a reminder, tax collectors were Jews who worked for the Romans, collecting more than was required from their own people and living off the difference. Righteous Jews, they viewed them as traitors. They were traitors. They were thieves. They wanted nothing to do with them. No one would have expected the Messiah of Israel to call a tax collector to follow him as a disciple. But this is exactly, precisely what our Lord did. And if that were not enough, he also ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. He ate with them. This is scandalous. In the eyes of the Pharisees, Christ defiled himself. He broke the Old Testament law by doing this. For the Messiah to act in such a way, it was blasphemy. It was a sign that he was not a righteous Jew, let alone the anointed one. 
And in response, our Lord made clear a much deeper wisdom that we should all pay attention to. He said that sick people, not healthy people, are in need of a doctor's care. He said that he came to not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He scandalized the self-righteous by calling St. Matthew to follow him by associating with people of bad reputation. And we know that in the Egyptian culture, this is a big deal. Reputation is a big deal. What will people say about us? Here's the thing. Christ did not endorse their sins. He risked his own reputation in order to lead them to repentance and healing. He showed them the mercy of God by calling them to a new life. It may seem foolish to some when we show hospitality or kindness or friendships to the tax collectors and the sinners of our day. To those who, whose behaviors and styles of life are different from the paths of holiness that we seek to pursue as Orthodox Christians. Judging and condemning a particular group of people for any reason is never our place. Never. And when we do so, we judge and condemn only ourselves for our pride and my self-righteousness, being like the Pharisees who criticized Christ for keeping company with people of bad reputation. Let's be clear. The point is not to abandon the teachings and the practices of our faith or to say that all ways of living are equally good and holy. That's not what we're saying. Our Lord called his disciples to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, and he expects the same of each one of us. And part of that righteousness, however, is not to abandon human beings, not to abandon our loved ones and our friends and our acquaintances, our co workers, when they happen to lose their way and even when they make terrible decisions about how they want to order their lives. Christ calls us to treat others as he treats us. And if they don't experience a measure of the love of Christ through us, then where? Where will they experience this? From whom? If they know Christians, as those who want nothing to do with them, they will likely never be drawn to the healing and the life of the kingdom. Why would they? Why would they? What good news do we offer by abandoning them? Of course, we have to be careful not to get into situations that we can't handle. There has to be wisdom. There has to be guidance. Christ made, and he continues to make, saints out of tax collectors, and prostitutes, and adulterers, and murderers, and Gentiles, and other unlikely characters like me. So where am I going with all this? When we pursue the example of Christ and his teachings, the Holy Spirit transforms, or I'm going to say transfigures, each one of us so that we become light bearers. We become light bearers. And when this happens, people are affected and transformed or transfigured by us, since we are vessels of the Holy Spirit. And this not only saves us, but it makes us useful to others and their salvation. It allows others to know God through us. It makes a tangible reality for those who struggle to know God otherwise. 
God has desired that each and every human being who has ever lived should come out of darkness and look towards the light, towards his light. He desires to make us partakers of this light. And when we are baptized and chrismated, we truly became his children. And he showers us with every possible gift. And he gave us to partake of the light, his light. Christ is yours and you are Christ's. And we are reminded that our faith is not theoretical or intellectual. We are reminded that our faith is real and living and transformative. It is transformative. What's the proof? The lives of normal men and women, just like you and me, and Levi the tax collector, who were transfigured in their own ways. And they were used by God to do wondrous things, to become wondrous human beings. That is the goal for our life, that we should truly come alive. God desires for us to be fully alive. He desires that we should have true communion with him, to acknowledge his presence everywhere. In fact, God is going to use us through the many trials and the difficulties in our world to mold a new generation of holy men and women. Why? He desires that we should become saints. And this is the only way. I pray that each one of us dedicates our lives to preserving this light of Christ, dedicating yourselves to growing this light and tending this fire. And this fire will warm you and sustain you and comfort you in the dark days. And there can be no doubt that as Christians, we will have dark days. We will have these seasons in our lives. There's no doubt about it. Darkness can never extinguish light. Death can never defeat life. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. May the Lord allow you the grace to struggle daily to know and acquire to see the light of God with your whole being in order that you might also be full of his divine light. May our lives also shine with the love of Jesus Christ to the glory of God forever.